Hello, I'm Jenny O'Connell, the Senior Painting Conservator at TMAG, and I'll be presenting today with Lisa Charleston, the Conservation Technician, on an exhibition called Behind the Layers, Authenticating the Stories of Paintings. This is an exhibition showing behind the scenes at TMAG, focusing on um, conservation of oil paintings and their frames. The exhibition opened on the 9th of March and closes on the 30th of April 2023. Behind the Layers focuses on conservation treatment of paintings and their frames from the 19th century. It also showcases research into the artists and gives detailed treatment information. We also looked at the materials used in art and conservation. The exhibition has been supported by the Keith Clark Foundation. This foundation has supported conservation at TMAG um, since 2020 and Keith Clark was the um, costume designer at the ABC. There are five paintings in the exhibition, plus one work on paper, and also a showcase of materials, including geological specimens related to pigments and um, materials that we use in conservation, such as resins for varnish. In 2008, TMAG received a donation of four portraits believed to be Mr. and Mrs. Gore, their daughter Elizabeth White, and her husband Jesse White. Uh, research since then, however, has found that the portraits are actually of Thomas and Sarah White, their daughter Rosina White, and her husband Charles Lovett. This was discovered through uh, reading of a will and also finding of a family tree. The two portraits of Thomas and Sarah White are in the Behind the Layers exhibition and have received conservation treatment. The four portraits have been attributed to Henry Mundy, who was a colonial artist in Tasmania. However, the portraits haven't been signed and there wasn't documentation linking the portraits directly to Henry Mundy. Therefore, we have been doing authentication research on the portraits. Henry Mundy was an English artist, a lithographer and teacher. He moved to Van Diemen's Land in 1831 as a free settler and um, worked in Ross. He moved to Launceston to work as an artist and then relocated to Hobart in 1842. He spent the 1840s undertaking portrait commissions, um, but passed away in 1848. Uh, he did stay at the Lamb Inn, which uh, was run by Thomas White, who is the subject of one of the portraits, and we know that they were fr good friends. Because Mundy rarely signed or dated his Tasmanian works, uh, we've had to look at the materials and techniques and uh, to determine authentication. The portrait of Sarah White was in poor condition when it arrived at TMAG. It was uh, discolored and yellow and also the canvas layer, the canvas was undulating so it wasn't um, quite smooth. It had been treated in the past so there is a, another canvas adhered to the back and there's quite a lot of overpaint. In the photographs you can see the before treatment photo uh, with the yellowed varnish and in the middle there's a photograph under raking light uh, which shows the undulations in the canvas and then the third photograph shows during treatment the removal of the varnish and overpaint on that left side of the painting and you can see um, how much whiter the clothes are and um, also how much richer the fabric is in the dress. Conservators use different photographic techniques to look at the paintings. In these two photographs, we're looking at the photo under ultraviolet fluorescence and we can see that in the photo on the left, there's that dark purple all the way around the um, portrait in the background and that is actually overpaint. 
We can also see that in the sitters hair and on her forehead and also in um, her bonnet and on her collar. In the photograph on the right where the overpaint has been removed, um, you can see that that dark area has been reduced. In our investigations on the artist, we sent the painting to the University of Melbourne um, for authentication research. So at the Greenwade Centre at Melbourne Uni, they have access to a portable XRF machine, which can look at the pigments in the artwork in a non-destructive manner. So in this photograph, you can see the numbers represent the areas where the analysis was taken. The research found that the artist has used lead white, vermilion and iron oxide pigments. These are all paints used during the 1840s, during that time that Henry Mundy was working in Hobart, but they also have been used earlier than that. So although the pigment analysis shows that it could possibly be from that time, um, it doesn't rule out that it could have been earlier. In the exhibition, we included some specimens that relate to these pigments. Marion Parker, who was a textile conservator and was working at the Greenway Centre at the time, undertook costume analysis on this painting. She determined that the woman is simply modestly dressed, as may fit an older woman, and the gown is dark green with a non-reflective surface, so possibly wool. The woolen day gown is considered respectable and good quality, but not expensive or particularly fashionable. The sleeves are full at the sleeve head and may possibly slope to fit at the wrist. And the sleeve cap appears slightly dropped below the shoulder line. These features suggest 1830s onwards. The cap is made of simple materials such as a fine linen or cotton muslin and the earrings and silk ribbons are decorative. Overall, this lady is not elaborately or expensively dressed by the standards of the day. A young or single woman would be less likely to have a portrait painted with indoor headwear such as this. Um, this analysis fits in um, with the theory that this is a portrait of Mrs. White and uh, um, also fits in with the dress of a publican's wife. The neckline lace is simple and the lace work is a Scottish or Irish technique known as broidery on glaze. There is a knot of ribbons which appear to be silk extending into a silk bow tied beneath the chin. The choice to have the ribbon displayed at the centre front neck creates a Victorian appearance suggesting post-1837. So this costume analysis has really narrowed down the date of the portrait to post-1837 which is also fitting in with uh, Henry Mundy's time painting portraits in Hobart in the 1840s. In this image, you can see that there's a brooch and that brooch has been added at a later date. So um, added up post, not added by the artist. The painting had thick overpaint on the surface, um, which was disfiguring the face and hair and I carefully scraped that back with a scalpel after softening it with some water. Um, after removing the overpaint I did find a long tear which has been um, filled and since it happened and would explain why there is the extra layer of canvas on the back to support the painting. I did not remove the brooch from the painting as I'm not sure when it was added or by whom and it may have been added by a family member. It may be a um, piece of family jewellery. There is a similar uh, brooch being worn by her daughter in her portrait. Hi, Lisa here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the frame on the portrait of Mrs White. So this frame raised a lot of questions for us. It's very unusual and we don't believe that it is her original frame. We don't know what happened to that. Uh, but 
we were able to loosely date the frame by looking at some of the manufacturing details as well as some stylistic elements. So we know that it's a hand carved frame. It's it's very very skillfully hand carved, uh, and we know that these skills were very rapidly declining by around 1800. They'd been replaced with new technologies in, in, involving um, casting and moulding. So the actual stylistic details, particularly this double swept outer curve and then the inner detail of the inverted julep design along that sight edge, they're very typical of, in reference to this diagram, very typical of um, transitional Rococo to neoclassical design elements. And the date range for this would have been something like the 1760s through to the 1790s. Uh, so this potentially puts this frame at between, let's say, 60 to 80 years older than the portrait, um, which also suggests it's less likely to have been made in Australia, considering that by 1800, uh, this style was already obsolete. <laughs> so we'll look a little more closely at the back of the frame. Um, the slide on the left hand side, we can see that the frame had been modified to accommodate the slightly different and wider size of the portrait of Mrs. White. It had been chiselled out, which had effectively very much weakened the frame. You can see daylight through the, uh, the front of the rebate there. So we just needed to, to stabilise and repair some of those aspects. And I'd like to point out the middle slide. The, this is a manufacturing detail of this frame. The whole thing is held together with these really beautiful little butterfly splines that, that run across the mitres. So we, we needed to stabilise those. They were quite weak and moving. And then the slide on the right hand side um, shows that on the front of the frame, there was a very thick bronze overpaint, which has been painted over the surface at some point, which is why the frame looks so dark. However, you can probably see in this slide that underneath all of that heavy bronze overpaint, there's a very beautiful 23 or 24 karat gold surface. So it's overall a, a very rare and valuable frame, which really points to the portrait being quite valued um, by the past owners who had it reframed in a, in a frame such as this. This portrait was displayed in the exhibition partially treated. So when I did the cleaning tests on the painting, which meant I removed some of the discoloured varnish, I could see there was going to be a high contrast between the original paint layer and that discoloured varnish and also with that overpaint. So I decided to only remove the varnish and overpaint on the left side of the painting so the audience could see the contrast. We often show before and after pictures to the public. However, in this exhibition, the public can see in the one painting uh, the difference between before and after treatment. The portrait of Thomas White was also in poor condition when it arrived at T Mag in 2008, um, even though it had been treated in the past. So, this painting is oil on canvas. However, it had been removed from its stretcher and glued onto a board. Some of the glue has caused deformations in the canvas surface that look like bubbles, and I was not able to flatten those. Um, so they are still visible. There were losses around the edges and where the canvas had started delaminating from the board. I started the treatment with uh, cleaning the surface of the painting and the image on the left shows the yellow discoloration coming off on the swab. Uh, this 
appears to be cigarette smoke damage and that would make sense if the um, painting had been in a pub. You can see the change between the um, white of the shirt and the yellow of the discoloration. After the cleaning, uh, the painting um, that had the yellow had been reduced on the painting. However, it did look quite dry and the paint needed to be resaturated. To saturate the colours, I applied two coats of varnish. The first was a gloss varnish and then a matte varnish, which I achieved by adding microcrystalline wax. In the exhibition, we have included uh, the resin that's used in varnish in the showcase. So the clear resin in the image is Laripel AAD1, which is a conservation grade varnish and is not meant to discolour for up to 100 years. The other crystals are the Dama resin and has been used by artists in varnish since 1826. This makes a very beautiful varnish, however it does yellow over time. And uh, these varnishes are often removed and redone on oil paintings. There were marks on the sitter's face which were quite disfiguring. At first I wasn't sure if they were meant to be there, perhaps they might have been aged spots, but I looked at them under the microscope and could see that they were sitting on top of the surface of the painting. The painting has a fine crackular pattern which is just cracking in the paint and that is normal um, sign of aging in paint. It is uh, secure so the painting wasn't flaking. But I did try and remove these marks with mechanical methods such as a scalpel and also with solvent. However, they um, weren't able to be removed very easily and I felt in the end it was safer just to retouch them. So I used uh, pigments and the varnish that I talked about in the previous slide uh, to retouch the, those areas and integrate them back into the um, face. Here is an image of the before and after treatment of the painting and more details of this painting treatment are available in a video. So over a 12 month period, um, Lisa and I had videos made about painting and frame conservation treatment and they were produced by Creative Grit and are available on the TMAG website. I'm going to talk a little bit about the framing of the Thomas White portrait. So once again, this is not the original frame and, and we we're also able to to gain some clues from the frame as to the journey of the artwork. Uh, so this frame pictured on the right hand side slide is uh, it's a stylized Louis the 15th revival type frame uh, dating from the early 1930s. It was made in Brisbane and we found a framers label which is pictured in the middle there that that had um, business address details from that we were able to date the, um, the broad range of manufacture to the early 1930s, late 1920s. The frame itself, um, as you can probably see, is quite badly damaged. There's a lot of losses and a very thick bronze overpaint. But, but perhaps more distracting is the very typically Art Deco 1930s stippled gesso finish. So overall, it's quite unsympathetic to a colonial portrait. And we decided it, it, it would be a very expensive and long treatment to restore the frame, uh, with the result being still an unsympathetic frame. So it was decided that we would reframe the portrait in a replica frame. Uh, so we needed to think quite carefully about the design and the um, proportions of the frame. So for the design, we, we looked to some of TMAG's original colonial portraiture framings from the 1840s. 
Um, and the one pictured here on the left slide is um, Dutero's portrait of Master Caleb Tapping uh, from 1842, which is thought to be an original hue and pine veneer frame manufactured by Robin Hood in Hobart. So this was a, a really appropriate template for us to base the design on. And um, you can see the profile drawing here. We were able to engage a local artisan framer who was a, also a furniture restorer, a colonial furniture restorer, to manufacture the frame, uh, which which is is made from a simple timber profile with a hue and pine veneer uh, surface, and and then we were we were also able to produce the gilded slit in house. And this slide shows the progression, and and the right hand side slide shows the uh, Mr. White in his new reproduction hue and pine veneer frame, looking much more comfortable. One of the goals of the funding from the Keith Clark Foundation was to allow TMAG to show paintings that hadn't been shown for a long time um, by undertaking conservation treatment and research into the paintings. This painting here, Venetian Fisher Boats by F. Cazzotti, is an example of a painting that hasn't been displayed for a long time at TMAG, if at all. Um, we have a slightly different research question here from the paintings attributed to Mundy, in that we have a signature this time and we can read it. However, we don't know anything about the artist. So we asked Amy Bartlett from Launceston, who's a curator and conservator, to undertake some research into the signature. Um, she could not find any other examples by this artist at Australian galleries or Australian collections, or um, find any documentation uh, around um, from genealogical records about the arrival of someone uh, by that name. There were documents relating to similar names. Um, however, we believe that this painting was probably brought over from Europe and um, that the painting is a, by a European artist rather than an Australian artist. Venetian Fisher Boats. The frame on this work is also really interesting. It's different to the previous ones we spoke about in that it is most likely the original framing. Uh, it's a Watts style of frame, which was heavily influenced by the pre-Raphaelite design movement. And interestingly, the Taurus pattern is has got a really very European or Italian character. It's full of sunflowers and it's quite abstract and chaotic. So this frame is would be dated to post 1860s. And all of that is consistent with being a, a European imported artwork. As far as the treatment goes, it was it was quite extensive. It was it was quite dirty. There are a lot of losses that needed to be recast and regilded. Um, we used um, examples of our materials for gilding and casting in the exhibition, in the, the case of the exhibition. And I guess an interesting point about this frame was that it, it really is a beautiful example of how uh, visual balance and interplay works between a painting and a frame. And also a good example of how a, a relatively minor treatment and really, really good gallery lighting and good presentation can breathe new life and sparkle into an artwork. This painting by William Charles Pigney called The River Hewen Near Its Headwaters, Tasmania from 1888 also hadn't been on display at TMAG for a long time due to damage to the paint layer. So the, this painting is quite small. It's oil on academy board 
and the paint layer is thin and brittle but also textured as you can see in the photograph on the right. The paint losses um, have been there for quite some time and, but have um, gotten worse over the years. This might have been due to uh, some mechanical damage to the painting and probably um, exacerbated by poor conditions such as uh, fluctuating relative humidity and temperature. So to treat the painting I had to consolidate the flaking paint and I used a um, conservation grade fish glue to do that um, and usually we would use a heated spatula to um, read here any loose paint flakes however I didn't want to put any pressure onto the paint layer because it was so brittle and fine. The Friends of TMAG a few years ago um, bought the conservation department a infrared heat tool which is a tool that can apply heat without any without actually touching the surface because it's infrared like radiant heat and also it doesn't have it, it doesn't blow any air so in the past conservators if they wanted to apply heat to a painting may have used like a hot air gun um, but that also would have been problematic because I didn't want to um, move any of those paint flakes so this tool was developed by RH Engineering which is a company in Victoria and um, TMAG was one of the first institutions to purchase this equipment and it was perfect for this treatment. So I was able to set the adhesive um, without touching the paint flakes. After that I, I um, retouched the losses with watercolour. We also glazed this painting, so Lisa as a conservation technician um, has rehoused all the paintings in this exhibition with Optium Acrylic. And the Optium Acrylic is um, an acrylic, it's used instead of glass, and uh, that's because it's lighter and if, if the paintings drop or damage it's not going to um, shatter. It's also very, it's non-reflective. Um, and is barely noticeable. And the benefits here are that a microclimate is um, created for the painting, which buffers it from those fluctuations in relative humidity and temperature. So the um, painting should be safer uh, in the future. As part of the authentication project on the Henry Mundy paintings, we also looked at the attribution to this portrait of James Ebenezer Bichonneau from the 1840s. This painting has been attributed to Henry Mundy, um, but again, we don't have a signature um, or any strong provenance relating it to the artist. So, um, James Bichonneau arrived in Hobart in 1843. In 1844, he became the president of the committee that planned the first public exhibition of paintings in Australia and he died in February 1851. There is a record of a portrait of Vishnu having been made. One of the ways um, that we could attribute the portrait to Vishnu was by comparing it to uh, the portrait on the left, which is a work on paper by Thomas Bock from 1848. And that has an inscription to state that it is a portrait of James Bichonneau. So we asked the audience to look at the two portraits and have a think about whether or not they look like the same person. As part of the research into the artworks by Henry Mundy, we sent this portrait of Mr Bichonneau to the Greenway Centre for analysis as well. So the Greenway Centre did infrared photography on the painting and that showed that there is uh, preparatory sketches or underdrawing under the paint layer. This is different from the other portraits attributed to Henry Mundy where we didn't find any underdrawing. So that raises a question there about attribution and is something we need to investigate further, possibly by doing more infrared photography on paintings attributed to Henry Mundy.
There's also a photograph of the painting under UV and that just shows um, two different varnishes. So it appears that the painting has been re-varnished in its lifetime. The Gwyn Wade Centre also did um, portable XRF on the portrait of Mr. Bichonneau to look at the pigments. And there were some traces of manganese and zinc white found. If zinc white was present, it would date the painting after 1845. And if manganese black was used, it would date the painting after 1871, making it too late for Henry Mundy. So some further testing was undertaken, which involved taking samples from the painting. And the cross section was examined and did not identify the zinc pigment particles. Um, and also didn't find manganese black pigment, but rather um, the use of an umber. So uh, the findings did correlate with uh, the 1840s, meaning this painting could have been painted by Henry Mundy in the 1840s. Another difference with this painting from the other paintings is that a um, rose matter was used rather than a vermilion pigment and in the exhibition we showed um, the uh, rose matter plant um, which is used to create a dye and then that can be made into a pigment which is now um, alizarin crimson. Another factor that we showed in the exhibition was that many artists pigments come from toxic materials. For instance, uh, lead white, also called flake white, was used by artists and was found in the um, ground layer of some of the paintings in the exhibition. It makes a flexible um, surface for the painting. Uh, however, it is, uh, because it has lead, it is toxic and is no longer used in artist materials. Uh, in this image you can see sericite compared with smithsonite which are two different specimens and um, are examples of where you can get lead white or zinc white which is uh, used in paintings. Over a 12 month period Creative Grit which is a production company, came in and filmed Lisa and me undertaking treatment on a painting and a frame. And this provides a long-term resource for the public on conservation at TMAG. As part of the exhibition, we organised a public program on colour mixing and matching. So colour mixing is an essential skill for conservation. Uh, in order to be able to retouch the uh, damages in the paintings or even to integrate some of the um, infills and losses in the frames. And so we asked Amber Coralak Stevenson, a Tasmanian artist, to run a workshop for the public and it was very successful and um, running it again on the 30th of April. And it's for beginners or artists or conservators who um, want to learn the skill or brush up on their techniques. Thank you for listening to this presentation on Behind the Layers. Um, it was made possible by the Keith Clark Foundation and I'd like to thank Vanessa Kowalski, Kushla Hill and Marion Parker from Greenway Conservation Services for their research and also to the friends for making this opportunity available and um, I hope that you enjoyed learning a bit about conservation at TMAG.